morning. Welcome to worship on this really beautiful day. It's a great day to be in worship, a great day to cheer on the Steelers, a great day to take a walk. It is beautiful. So if you notice on your in your bulletins, the front of it says, perhaps you were born for such a time as this. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the story of Esther, which is one of my favorite stories. So I figured it was time for story time. Um, and that's what we're going to do today. Talk about Esther and how she was um, used by God, by where she was at a certain time in history, and how she responded to that. And then try to connect that to where we are and how we might respond to God's call to us. So, um, before we begin our call to worship, are there any announcements this, for this week? Yes. Um, if you need, if you sign up to make soup, there are containers in the office. If you sign up to make soup, there are containers in the office. There are little bags beside it. If you need, there's um, bowls and lids. And then if you do make the soup, if you could just label it. Um, We're handing it out next Friday. So sometime before next Friday. What's that? When we bring the soup to the church, which when should we bring it? Where should we put it? Um there's there's room there's some room downstairs in the fridge. Um I'm not sure. I guess just if you bring it before we're handing it out around five on Friday. Okay. Um, and then if you signed up to Hand it out really in this Friday at uh, 5 o'clock. Um, <coughs> yeah, when you refer to the label on the soup, it's not like so so fabulous. It's the name of the soup that you made, like vegetable on it. Best soup ever. <laughs> Used to never put my name on anything or something. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're kind of figuring out as we go. So maybe if you can't be here Friday, you can be there during the refrigerator. But if not, we can um, take care of it Friday and hand it out. So, thank you. I want to say thank you to the Gassus who made food for the men's shelter last week. We delivered it, and that's always a blessing to do that. So thank you for that. Thank you, church, for continuing that ministry. Let's join now in the call to confession. Jesus calls us, inviting us in. Holy, holy, holy God. The Spirit calls, inviting us to listen. Holy, holy, holy Christ. The Father calls, adopting us as family. Holy, holy, holy Spirit. Come to worship. Now's the time to notice who's here and Pick someone to pray for for next week. Um, greet each other as you distance. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, renew us in your presence this day. As we gather to bless your name and to sing your praise, Bless us with your glorious love and your guiding light. Strengthen us each and every hour through the power of your Holy Spirit and the wisdom of your Holy Word. In hope and joy we pray. Amen. Our first um, hymn this morning is one I hope that you will recognize if you don't know it. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. An old, old piece that has words that give us the joy to sing to our Lord and God, our Creator, our Redeemer, and Sustainer. Will you stand as you are able as we sing with joy? Joyful, joyful, we adore you.
Jews from another. 
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said before, I feel like we need a story. And so the passage for today from the lectionary is the passage found in the book of Esther. And I love this book. Esther's the heroine of the book. And so every third, four, every four years, this is in the lectionary passage. And I preach on Esther every four years because I love it. And it never gets old to me. So I hope that you like this story as much as I do. Um, so if we're going to talk about the story, we realize that Esther becomes the hero by being at the right place at the right time when she was needed and she was willing then to act. She's willing to um, move out and she took a risk. She recognized the need for action. She moves to meet it, which took a lot of strength and a lot of courage. But her options weren't so good um, and she wasn't assured that things were gonna work out, but she did it anyway. So let's look at the story. The story begins in the court of King Xerxes. It's the X thing on the little squares that you have when the little kids are playing with blocks. Um, Xerxes just fired his queen because she had refused to dance for him in front of a banquet um, of men who had been drinking for seven days and nights. Um, the Old Testament mentions that's how long these people had gathered and had been drinking. She knew that probably wouldn't be healthy if she refused to go, and I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have been that healthy for her to dance in front of men who'd been drinking for seven days. But from what we read, um, she did not get killed for doing that. She um, just, they got rid of her. And if you have time this afternoon, you should get um, the book of Esther and read it because it's really interesting. Um, one of the reasons why the king had to fire her was because after she refused to do what he said, other men in the palace said, we're gonna have no ability to control our wives if you don't get do something here. So it's just, it's a great book. Um, so also we need to know something about Xerxes. We need to know that he had a terrible reputation that he had a very bad temper. In a short temper, he didn't um, belong, he didn't put up with anything, and he had people killed all the time. There's one story in one of the commentaries that he was angry about um, something, and he was angry about the flooding, so he had his 300 um, army men go down, go in the water, and give the water 300 lashes. <laughs> Um, one time he had a friend who was in a high position who asked that his son not be drafted and he got mad and he had the person cut in half and had the army march between the two different parts of this person. So he was crazy. Um, he was very wealthy. Uh, at the beginning of the book we read about all the wealth that he had and they go into details about his furniture and the gold things that he had in his house and how wealthy he was. So he would have been the top 1% that we read about today. He was top 1% of the world as far as having money. So the last queen is gone. She didn't get killed, but she's gone. And so then they had this worldwide search for the um, new queen, kind of like Miss Universe of the ancient world. And they had all these people contesting, the contestants come in. So this beautiful woman, young teenage girl, was chosen to be the queen, and that was Esther. And it also talks about, there are only four chapters here, so it's worth reading, um, that she was chosen after a year of preparation. That she had oils and spices, she had massages, she was prepared to um, enter into this contest and she won. So Esther now has been chosen to be the queen. Esther's the queen. Um, we need to know some other people in the story. One person is named Mordecai. Mordecai is an older relative of Esther and he had been her caretaker because we find that her parents had been killed probably in one of the times when uh, people came into her town and killed people to take over the town and people had to run and be refugees 
as some other group that was stronger took over. So Esther's living now in the city of Susa, uh, probably as a refugee from the town that she grew up in, uh, of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem people had been captured and taken to Babylon, a lot of them. So she was living with a relative who was caring for her as a daughter. And he noticed that the king was looking for a new queen, and he's the one that talked her into applying for this job. And she was called, she was uh, selected. So now, so just remember that. Now we have um, Mordecai was Jewish, and Esther was Jewish. King Xerxes and the re residents of the city of Susa were not Jewish, so that comes into practice later. Mordecai told Esther, just don't mention the fact that you're Jewish when you um, go into the palace. People didn't like the Jews, and so he suggested it would be smarter if she just not mention that was her nationality. Okay, now Esther's inside the wall of the palace, and once you're in there, she could never come out. We saw that in the lab. You know, that princess couldn't get out. <laughs> anyway, they couldn't get out because for safety, they had to stay in there. So, instead of seeing her then every day, Mordecai would go to the gates of the palace, sit outside the gates, and send messages into Esther so that they could continue to communicate. Um, it was right before we had Facebook, so he had to communicate that way. So one day, Mordecai, who did this on a daily basis because he cared about Esther and he wanted to keep connected to her, Mordecai is sitting at the gate, um, outside the palace, and he's waiting to send Queen Esther a message. And he overheard these two um, guards at the gate, and they were plotting to kill the king. It's a great story. Um, so Mordecai sent word to Esther to warn the king that these two people were, gonna, were planning to kill him. So she reported the two guards. Um, and, she, and the idea was they were angry about something the king had done. She reported that to the king and gave credit to Mordecai and said, it's that Jewish guy that's sitting at the gate. He gave me this message. The king received the information and he had them killed and then recorded this. Because everything that was done was recorded in this big journal that they had. Um, to remember for later. So go remember that he wrote that he had it written down that this happened and that the person outside the gate was the one who actually saved him. Okay, so now here comes the plot in the story. So I mentioned that Mordecai would sit at the gate every day. Um, so more important people would go through the gate at a daily on a daily basis. People who ran the government would come in and out of the gate. And we find um, that some of those people were very egotistical. We get that. Um, one of the most egotistical of all of these was named Haman. Haman is the bad guy in the story. Um, he came to work every day, and when he passed by these people that were outside the gate, probably many of them were begging, they would bow down to him because he was so rich and he was so important. Haman was a big deal, and he was getting to be a bigger deal. He'd just been promoted, and he was maybe the second highest in the whole land, right under the king. So everybody bowed down to him, except Mordecai, because Mordecai was Jewish, and you don't bow down to anyone except God. So when Haman saw Mordecai and saw that he didn't bow down to him, a very arrogant person would be offended at that. He was enraged, that's a Bible word, enraged. Um, in fact, he was so angry that he went to the king and he proposed that not only this dirty little man outside the gate be killed, but Haman found out that Mordecai was Jewish, and so Haman said, I think all of these people need to die. That um, they have been planning. He went to the king, and being the lying, cheating, entitled, arrogant person that he was, he made up a story about this group of people who were trying to kill the king, or out to kill the king. And then he added that he, being a loyal um, subject of the king, wanted to make sure that this treasonous group of people wouldn't be um, hurting him, and 
he would be glad to spend um, all of this money, this silver, so that these people could be killed. All for the good of the king, of course. It's like Eddie Haskell of the Old Testament. Um, king Xerxes, Xerxes loved the fact that he was being so grateful and caring for him that he said to Haman, don't worry about the money, I'll take care of it. Um, and uh, then the king signed an edict that day that said that all of the, that on the 12th day of the 12th month, there would be a decree that all men, women, and children who were Jewish would be killed. And then the king sealed it with his ring. So the news then went out to all of the world. Um, remember, Xerxes owned land or was, was the ruler of land from Egypt all over the Middle East as far as India. So he he was ruling the um, the world that people knew at that time. Um, in order to annihilate the Jews, in order to annihilate the Jews, they had to put up a, a sign, get information out, seal it, and on that particular day, that action was going to happen. Um, so, also it said, not only do you kill the Jews, but you can take all of their things. So that was the edict. So Esther was in the palace. She didn't know any of this was going on. She didn't have any information from the outside world. So um, a few days later, she noticed that Mordecai was at the gate and he looked awful. He was covered with ashes. His face was uh, covered with ashes. He was wearing um, sackcloths. And so she knew something terrible had happened, but she didn't know what it was. So she sent information to find out. Mordecai wrote back um, what had happened. And that he said that she was in a safe place, but as she was sitting in a safe place, that all of her people were in danger of death and that they were going to be killed on this 12th day of the 12th month. And that she needed to do something about this. Esther was a beautiful teenage girl in a palace, and now her caretaker was telling her that she needed to help the whole nation from being destroyed. If she didn't do something, they were going to be killed. And it just made look, maybe all these awful things that had happened to her in her life, the death of her mother and father, moving to another city, living with Mordecai, maybe all of that was to allow her to be in the place where she was so that she would have opportunity to save her people. Not pressure on you, Esther, but just in case. Maybe God has placed you in this time and place for such a time as this. Who knows, but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. So we read that Esther thinks about this for a few days, and then in the scripture passage we heard today, she says, Go and ga go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, neither day. I and my maidservants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So here it's interesting to notice she didn't actually do this on her own. She went with the community of her Jewish faith, supporting her and um, praying for her. So Mordecai did this. Um, and I need to mention for security reasons, the king was in a private chamber where no one was allowed to enter. So anyone who wasn't summoned by the king and tried to get in to see the king would be killed immediately. And this is for security. People wanted to kill kings, as we see today when leaders get assassinated. Um, so they had really strong protections. So there was a gate, and there was the inner, inner doors, and then there was the final door into his own um, room. So if you come into this room without an invitation, you would be killed. It was the law. And it would be, you'd be killed by the guards that were standing there, unless the king would raise his scepter to the person that came in. So he had to be looking up to see that before the person got killed, and he had to be in a mood to let the person in, because we 
We know that he was a little unbalanced here and there. Um, so Esther's going in there really was um, a, not something that was going to be good for her. I mean, she really risked, and she knew that risk was there. Esther's faced with the option of risking her own life or knowing that she didn't do that and that her people would be wiped out. So her response finally is, if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. An amazing story. Um, the king sig signals Esther. So she goes in, and the king signals Esther, and he asks her why she's come to dinner, or why she was there. Now, she, he knows she just risked her life, so something's going on here that's important. And um, he asks her what she wants, and she says, I'd like for you to come to dinner tonight. So then she left. So he goes back to his uh, sleeping quarters that night, and he, he can't sleep. I mean, this makes sense. She risked her life, and she risked her life to ask me to dinner. That doesn't make sense, so I wonder what's up with, with that. He can't sleep. He calls his servants, the king, he calls his servants in and asks them to, to read to him, read some of the journals, read about what's gone on in the kingdom. So the servants are reading about all the things that happened over the last year or two, and they come to the part where Mordecai, some little Jewish guy by the gate, saved him by reporting a plot to overthrow the king. And the king realizes, did we ever thank him for that? He said, no, I don't think we don't have any record of that. So the king decides we need to thank that Mordecai guy. So in the morning, um, he's deciding to do this. And Haman comes to work, being the big shot that he is. And he goes to the palace early, and the king asks him a question. The king says, "What should happen if someone who, what should happen to someone who pleases the king? How can we honor someone who pleases the king?" Now, Haman, we know about him. We know that he's pretty arrogant, so he thinks the king's talking about him, and he's just a great spring. And he says, um, "I think you should um, announce to the town this is someone." who has pleased the king. Maybe have him ride on the king's horse and um, have an important person, you know, lead the, the horse around and make this announcement. This is someone who is um, found favor with the king. So Haman's really excited because he knows he's the one they're talking about. And so the king said, oh, that's a good idea. All right, so go to the gate. There's a little Jewish guy out there and he's the person. How about that for Haman? So now, um, Haman is going to be the one that has to parade this Mordecai around town, yelling, this is someone who has pleased the king. So that evening, after Haman goes home and, and he's humiliated, um, he gets cleaned up and he is asked to go to dinner with the king because Esther asked him to do that. So Esther's about to have dinner. She also has invited Haman. She asked the king, why at dinner? She said, why are you going to kill all my people? This is the first time he has known that she is Jewish. So the king has no idea what's going on. What do you mean? Who's going to kill all? Who's going to kill his queen? And Esther points to Haman and said, he's, he's the one. Um, he's dining with us, and I'm Jewish, and he has convinced you to have needed to kill all the people. So the king is furious, which is not a good thing when this particular king gets angry. He leaves the room. So then Haman tries to get East Esther to show mercy. And Haman is scared now because he knows he's, he's a dead man walking. And um, he goes over and kind of jumps on the couch that Esther's on. Then the king comes back in the room and the king thinks you're attacking you're trying to put the moves on my wife here. Um, he's trying to seduce Esther, and um, Haman kills Mordecai. I did forget to say something, because in the meantime, Haman goes home um, after he found out he was invited to the palace. And there's actually another meal in there where she says, I, the king says, I'll give you anything you want. Just tell me what you want. And she said, could you come back? Um, and later today for dinner. So the suspense arises, and during that break, 
Haman goes home and he's complaining about Mordecai. And his wife said, quit complaining. Just build a gallows and just hang it up. You have power. You can do this. Um, so he does that. Then he comes back. I forgot that part. Then he comes back and he's having dinner. And, and the king says, what do you want? And Esther says, I don't want you to kill my people. And that's the first time anybody in the room knew that Esther was Jewish. So um, then the king leaves. He comes back in. Now he thinks that um, Haman is trying to seduce Esther, and he wants, he says Haman's going to have to be killed. And the guards say, well, there's this fabulous gallows right over here if you want to use that. So that's what they use. Great story, isn't it? But the story is not just because it's just a, the person who has caused a lot of trouble gets punished at the end. The point of the story, and the reason why we look to this scripture, is to think about, um, I want us to think about the part where um, <laughs> Esther and Mordecai are together. And Esther said, maybe Esther, or Mordecai says, maybe Esther, all of the things in your life, all the struggles, all the successes, all the times that you've, you've worked, have placed you in, in this place in history. In this time and place, for such a time as this, now what are you going to do about that? And it was evident that once Esther knew all the information and knew that if she didn't say something, that her people would be hurt, even though there was a passage that said God's not going to let all the people be destroyed just because you don't do what you're supposed to do. But maybe that's why you're here. I think that's something that we can be thinking about. The, for such a time as this. I mean, it comes up a lot when you are in certain situations and maybe you connect to people in a way that you never expected to. So I want you to think about your life, think about the things that you've been through. Some of you have been through struggles that would be on the same level of Esther and suffering and loss. So what... Um, that may allow you to bring that kind of gift to the table. You would have an understanding that someone that hasn't had that experience does not have. So what allows you to say, maybe all of these things that happened in my life prepared me for such a time as this. All of what you've gone through has been preparation. Um, it has informed you, it has molded you, your life your lives have molded you, the people in your lives have molded you into the person you are today with gifts to offer at this time in your life, in the circumstance that you're in right now. Um, you all know that I visited, I had a week with my kindergarten friends. We were flying to Wisconsin, and on that trip, one of my friends, Debbie, was sitting beside an, another woman who they didn't, they didn't know each other, but during the flight, they were talking. And um, we were kind of laughing because Debbie was talking the whole time. At the end of the trip, she told us, she introduced us to the person that she had been traveling beside. And she said, um, I told her that we would pray for her because she's coming to visit her sister who is sep has sepsis and she's in the hospital and she's really worried about her health. And so I said that we would pray for her. And Debbie was kind to her and caring for her. And we thought, you know, for such a time as this, you were on that plane sitting beside that person that you didn't know, and you were willing to talk to her and get to know what her life was um, experiencing, and you promised to pray for her. And we did pray for her, morning and evening. Um, we don't know how she is. Debbie doesn't know her name or where she's from. But... Um, one of the interesting things, too, is Debbie said to me, you should have been sitting there because you, you're the minister. You should have been sitting there. That's not true. I wasn't. Uh, the people that do the most hands-on, person-to-person -person things in this world are you. You are the ones who are in situations to meet people where they are. Um, you, you take first-grade kids and you love them. You care for people at your work. You are honest. You um, illustrate what it's like to be 
someone who follows Christ. So realize how important you are right now in your situation and that all of the things in life so far have been uh, part of what prepares you for being able to say, um, I'm going to go ahead and do this, and if it works, it works. But I can't miss those opportunities. So you're here in worship, and you are this worshiping community at this time and place for a purpose. You're part of the worshiping community, and you're part of this journey that we as a church community are going through together. You're here today for a purpose. Sometimes we tend to think that we're not useful to God. Maybe we're too young or maybe we're too old. Um, I said in Sunday school, there's 10 minutes in life where you're just the right age and then that's it. Um, you may feel like, like your voice is not heard any longer and that's just not true. You are useful. This church is useful. You are an important servant of God and we can pray, you can share, you can be the voice of God to those around you in the community, and you make a difference. So this week, try to see where God is directing you so that you don't miss opportunities to um, be Christ in community. Esther teaches us a life lesson here. Esther teaches us to notice the situations in our lives, to connect to our circumstances when the need is around us, Maybe you're in a situation right now where you can be of service to God just because of your circumstance, just because you are a witness of strength to others. Maybe God's allowed you to be in the place that you are for such a time as this. So in some way, our church, our worshiping community is here for such a time as this. And there are challenges in church today. Um, but maybe Bellevue United Presbyterian Church is here to be a part of the solution. Maybe each one of you is here for such a time as this. God's involved in the redemptive ministry of this congregation, and you are the group that God has placed here and now for such a time as this. Both as a church and as individuals, may you have eyes to see and ears to hear places where God is using you throughout this week. Amen. Let us now stand as you are able, and we will reaffirm our faith by using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
Let's now move um, to our tithes and offerings. We are still not passing the plate, so they are in the back of the church and on the exits, this side of the church. Um, once again, it is, it is wonderful that you have been so faithful in giving over this last year and a half. So we thank you for that, knowing that it is a response to what God has given you, um, and that we are blessed when we are able to give. So let us offer a prayer of dedication now. Dear God of peace and generosity, we strive to live each day with an attitude of thankfulness and sharing. We ask that you are with those who are in need, for those who offer these gifts, and for those who will receive them. And we dedicate these gifts to further the kingdom of God here on earth as we dedicate our lives to allow us to reach out and be the hands and feet of Christ wherever we go. We offer this with grateful grace and in Jesus' name, amen. Each week we join together in our prayers of the people. So are there any prayer concerns for this day?
love as well as they can. In the midst of change and struggle, we're reminded that you are making us new and that we hold to your message of hope and renewal. Help us to listen to your voice calling our name, reminding us of your love for us personally. And I that um, stretches to each person that we meet. We continue to pray for those members of the fan of this church who are still in in grief, um, dealing with the loss of beloved members of their family. So we continue to pray for Lynn Strauss's family. We now pray for Peg Cusick's sister's family, for Peg and the relatives, those who have been close to Mary St. Vincent. We pray that they feel your healing and your power and your grace. We pray for Bruce Adams, for Ted Zog, Dorothy Geary, Spence, for Ed Quattro and Norman Sloan's families as they grieve beloved members of their family. Help them to feel your love and care. We continue to pray for Wayne Daly and for Linda as he continues to gain strength. We pray for Sophie's Mimi for um, continued healing. We thank you for medical help. Help her to feel your love and your strength. We pray for our shut-ins for Pat Christie and Esther Sawyer. We pray for our mission co-workers, Shelvis and Nancy Smith Mathers in South Sudan. We pray for Airman Kim, Kim Keener as she serves overseas. We know that you hear our silent prayers, our private prayers for family struggles, for challenges and fears. Please allow each person praying to understand your strength, your love, and your power. God, in your mercy, we ask that you hear our prayer. In all of this, we give thanks to you for being ever-present. And now, together as a worshiping community, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is one that the words are going to seem new to you, but the, the tune you know. So that's helpful. So the tune is going to be the church is one foundation. Okay, so get that tune in your head. Turn and look at the words. And this is a great hymn written about the story of Esther. And I love that we're going to walk out of our worship today being reminded not only of what happened to Esther, but how we can apply it to our lives. So pay close attention to the very last moments. Okay? Would you stand as you are able to sing to God's prayer? Thank you.
Amen. Amen.